Okay, uh, won't worry about the introduction. I think everybody knows me. Uh, I'm retired from Boeing. And when I was there, I did uh, quite a bit of work on their gyros uh, gyroscope systems there. And this is a pictorial of what's left of the system. I had a lot of trouble getting it out, uh, out the door. Um, the intellectual property guys uh, went through the ceiling because I was releasing Boeing photographs and they fine tooth combed them, uh, something about picture being worth a thousand words. Uh, as some of you know, there's usually a good story behind most of my pitches. Oops, we did push too many buttons already. Let's try that again. Okay. Yeah, uh, this presentation uh, is non-technical. Uh, it's a history of Boeing's uh, CMG work. And it started back in the early 60s and continued on into the 90s. Uh, I got involved with it in 1995 when I took over operations of the GNC lab. Uh, it's at the Kent Space Center there. And the, my lab there and the building it was in were uh, trashed during the uh, earthquake 2001. Uh, and these pictures are pretty much all that's left of it. Uh, this picture of the uh, Kent facilities there with Mount Rainier in the background. On a historic note, uh, the Apollo uh, moon rocket, the, the first stage was designed and built here. Matter of fact, that tall building you see in the middle of the complex there was specially designed to house that thing because it's eight, uh, 80 foot tall. And then also, um, the lunar rover was built and developed here uh, in the GNC lab, but that's long before my time. Uh, when, when the building was trashed and they found in one of the cubby hole closets, the prototype of the uh, moon buggy there, and it's now on display at the uh, Boeing's Museum of Flight. Uh, all the uh, G GNC work uh, with the CMGs and that was all done at this facility. Uh, starting off with uh, basic operating procedures uh, before we dig into the details, a little short tutorial on gyro operation for people that are not familiar with them. Uh, basically, a gyro has uh, three vectors that uh, control it. Uh, one is the spin vector, it's highlighted in red there. And then uh, the uh, torquer input, uh, which is highlighted in green, and then the gyro's output vector, which is highlighted in blue, and they're all at 90 degrees or orthogonal. Uh, when you run the numbers, uh, this makes the gyro's output force uh, proportional to three things. One is the mass of the rotor, and then the speed of the rotor, and then the speed of the torquing. All those contribute to the uh, uh, output uh, of the gyro's. Now, uh, the term scissoring I picked up from my boss. Uh, the, tech, the correct technical term is actually differential or dual operation. But uh, when you have two gyros operating uh, in this mode, you can get linear force out of them, which everybody says you can't. Uh, you, the ground rules are you have to have two gyros uh, um, that are equal, same spin, same mass but you torque them in different directions. If you look at the torquer vectors here, the green one, this one's torqued one way and this one's torqued the other way. The blue is the output vectors and the red is the spin vectors. This particular model has a figure eight belt that uh, does the scissoring. The, the torquer motor's on the back side, so you can't see it. But uh, this was a little demo model we had. So that makes the uh, output vector two times the torque rate plus the differential angle uh, between them, assuming the rotor mass and RPM are the same. Now this scissoring operation, which I just mentioned there, uh, it generates a sawtooth uh, torquing rate. Uh, we use the term scissoring, which may or may not be correct. I'd say it's differential operation. Uh, what you do is you move them slow in one direction, fast in the other. And depending on whether it's fast together and slow apart, it generates uh, a force. When you move it slow, you get a small force. 
And then when you move them fast, you get a large force and that generates an average force. That's the principle behind the uh, operation. Now we'll just dig into the pictures uh, of what Boeing's had uh, used over the years. They started with small test articles and they moved up to some pretty good size ones. Uh, this is one of the uh, first small ones around there. You can see two gyros here and then there's a silver figure eight band that does the uh, scissoring. Uh, torquer motor is not uh, shown there. But uh, that was uh, one of the starting ones, a little electric motor uh, gyro operated, kind of like the ones we get from uh, uh, gyroscope.com. Uh, another type that we used at Boeing was uh, reaction wheels. Uh, these are about six or eight inches in diameter and they run in a vacuum can. Uh, the black color is a little difficult to see the thing, but I have an exploded view in the next picture where you can see the motor with the rotor and the bearing and the vacuum can it sits in and electronics and there's the thing just sitting together and this is without the armature. They had a, quite a few gyros that we ran uh, different sizes and for different operations. Uh, this was uh, the next bigger size, I call them a medium sized gyro. Uh, they used quite a few of these around there. Uh, the flywheel is basically in the middle here. It sits in a vacuum can and then the torquer motor and the sensors are on the end. And then we have these big fellows here. These are big Sperry gyros. Uh, these are the ones I worked on when I took over the lab. Uh, there was four of them on the test article. Your torquer motor is over here in blue. The power electronics is down here. And then the uh, position sensor is over here. The red can you see is actually a vacuum can. The rotor inside there is about two foot in diameter. And uh, Boeing Safety made us put these plexiglass bubbles on to protect your fingers. They're an absolute joke because if that thing lets go, a quarter inch of plastic isn't going to stop it. However, Boeing Safety, what it is, uh, they don't want to pinch your fingers. Uh, side note there, my boss told me to take very good care of them because they were worth more than me. Uh, approximate value is about a million bucks a pop. And then I uh, also show you a few uh, pictures of the GNC lab facilities through the years. Uh, this was when they were building the space room. Uh, it had an uh, air pad in there for uh, seismic isolation. It was uh, 20 foot square. And it floated on seven air uh, cylinders. Uh, they were about two foot in diameter. Two of them you can see in the picture. There was actually seven of them that held it up. Uh, it was 20 foot square uh, reinforced concrete. It weighed about 70,000 pounds. And it provided seismic isolation down to micro G's. And then in the middle, there was a four foot post that had a, uh, I call it a bowling ball sized air bearing on it. Uh, you'll see pictures of those later. Uh, myself and another engineer happened to be standing on this air pad uh, when the earthquake hit and we didn't feel anything. It worked perfectly. It was only when the overhead crane started dancing that I knew something was wrong. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, doorway going into the room there. Uh, when it was running, nobody was allowed in there because it was very dangerous. But this was our space room. Uh, you could look through that window there in the little peephole and you didn't know any different than if you were looking through space. There were stars and sun and satellites and everything else in there. And uh, we could simulate everything uh, in there except for a uh, vacuum. Uh, you had to calculate air drag when you were doing the, the movements, but the chamber was EMI, thermal, optical, vibration, and, all, and acoustic shielded. So most of the stuff you could uh, uh, simulate except for air. And uh, looking over here at the console, the controls on the left were for the air pad, controls in the middle were for the uh, air bearing, and the controls on the right side here were for the test article. Now there was a little four foot lip 
uh, on the air pad so that we could mount measuring uh, instruments. We've got a theodolite here uh, looking through the peephole. That's the same stuff uh, surveyors use. So we can take measurements uh, directly calibrated to the test article. Inside the chamber, uh, we can position Hemholtz coils in there uh, anywhere from one dimensional, two dimensional or three dimensional to generate magnetic fields around the uh, test article uh, to simulate space conditions. Uh, and one of the walls there, the chamber, we had uh, the sun, what we called the sun simulator, the brightness and the number of lights lit and the focus of the lights could all be adjusted to simulate any distance from the sun. And you see it's a honeycomb assembly and then each in the center of each honeycomb is a light bulb and uh, the intensity and the, the distance uh, in the filtering could all be adjusted. Uh, there was also star pattern lights. However, I don't have any pictures of them. If you're familiar with the uh, light bright toy that kids use where you uh, poke little plastic uh, things into a pattern to make uh, stars and then it's lit from behind. They were very similar to that, only industrial strength. Here's an oldie but moldies. Uh, picture of the control room uh, dated about the early 70s. As you can see, uh, all this data was collected on strip chart recorders. If you count them, there's nine of them there. Not a, not a PC in sight because they hadn't been invented yet. Taking a closer look at the test article, we'll show you a little bit about it. Uh, it had a sun sensor mounted on it. And that was a uh, look at the sun or the simulated sun anyway. There was uh, four sensors and then they take differential readings, uh, brightness and displacement. And that's used for navigation and control purposes. On top of the test article, they had a sun tracker which did pretty much the same thing uh, with the star patterns only this worked more or less like a TV camera. It was a, a Viticon tube. Uh, the, figuring out the star patterns was a little more difficult than figuring out the sun. And then we had one antique machine here. That's the data acquisition. If you look up there, 16 bits address, 8 bit data. Uh, you could replace the whole kit and caboodle with uh, one laptop right now. Uh, we use the uh, uh, all the battery packs to keep this thing running uh, as counterweights and ballast uh, to balance it. And then we move on to the test articles uh, that I've uh, been using. This one is uh, it's a circular one. Uh, you can only see one little gyro here. It had a whole bunch. There was about a, almost a dozen little gyros in there. Um, a lot of electronics and battery packs. Uh, if you look at the guy's shirt and tie here, we got a white shirt and a tie, black and white picture, uh, 260 Simpson voltmeter. So this place is at uh, very early 60s. Now I take that test article and they put it in the black room there. Uh, there's a good picture of the air bearing. High pressure nitrogen comes up the hose and there's a whole bunch of little holes in this uh, bowling ball and it floats on uh, nitrogen gas. So there's zero friction. And then the pivot is allowed to move and then the gyroscopes uh, control the movement of the uh, test article. Uh, again, uh, you got a black and white picture, white shirt, bow tie. So you're looking uh, maybe mid 60s there. Uh, this picture here is of it operating. Uh, the arm here is locked, so it, it's not going to flop around, but uh, they were testing the degrees of movement. It's a time lapse picture, but you can see how it floats on the air bearing there. And then all the movement of the test article was controlled by the gyroscopes on board. Uh, this is another one that they had in there on the air pad, uh, a little bit bigger system. This uses the medium uh, size gyros. There's two of them on this arm. 
uh, there's a tripod here and then the air bearing, uh, the bowling ball sits up in here. It's counterbalanced uh, by the uh, data acquisition and all the battery packs. Now again, uh, you got a black and white picture and she's got a mini skirt on. So we're looking at about late sixties. Uh, okay, this one is another one back in the black room here. They're measuring degrees of freedom uh, using protractors and pointers. Uh, you can see the sun simulator in the background, and then uh, you got uh, pointers and protractors for two axes of movement. Okay, this was another style. Uh, you come in there, you have uh, there's uh, six gyros, there's three on either end of the medium sized gyros, and there's three back here. And this is the right side view. And again, you got a black, uh, black and white picture. That hairdo puts it at about early 70s. Uh, here we go. This is looking at the other side of the test article, a little bit closer view. Uh, you can see the electronics and all the battery packs stuffed all around there. And uh, he's got the control box. Uh, now we got a colored shirt and tie with lamb chops. So we're looking at 70s now. OK, uh, this is the uh, same test article. You can see a little bit better view of the three gyros on this end. The back three are hidden. Uh, we have an antenna on this end. Uh, and uh, he's now wearing a white lab coat. And we got colored pictures. So we're looking at late 70s. Uh, you can also see a picture of the overhead crane. It's a two-ton crane. And that's, uh, like I said, I was standing on this pad, uh, myself and another engineer. And when this thing started dancing around, that's when I knew there was trouble. But we didn't feel a thing. It compensated 100%. Now, this was the large test article uh, that was in use when I came into the uh, lab. Uh, it was used through the 80s and 90s. Uh, our nickname for it was Old Bug Eyes, because if you looked at it from the front, it looked like the head of a fly. And uh, you can see the sun simulator over here in the background. And uh, that's the front view of it. And the next one, uh, we have a rear view. This is the other two gyros back here. You can see the counterweights, a lot of the battery packs. And it's being, the batteries are being charged. You got the power, power leads in here and sun simulators in the background there. But uh, if you notice the scratch marks on the floor, it didn't always behave properly. I told the boss, if you put a chair up on top of this thing, it would be, it would beat any mechanical bull in town because it would whip around in circles, jump up and down and everything else. However, uh, it was extremely dangerous because it didn't always obey commands and it would crash. One of the tests we had to do uh, was uh, when a satellite um, got out to geosync orbit on, on station keeping, it had to maintain a, refer a sta stable reference platform uh, because you have an antenna from the previous pictures that had to stay at a certain orientation. So we developed this rig uh, put around it to do uh, uh, the uh, inertial measurements. Now, you, this is the side view here. You, you had this balance beam that as this thing would maneuver, the balance beam had to stay perfectly level. It was in spite of the fact that if this went up and down or twisted sideways or whatever, this article along with its sensors had to maintain uh, a fixed position. It had uh, that simulated the uh, antenna pointing of the satellites. And again, you see the scratch marks on the floor uh, for obvious reasons when it didn't work quite well. And that's pretty much uh, all the pictures I had through the years. This was the building as they were de uh, demolishing it. My lab sat in this corner here. And where this rust pile 
of junk is setting up is setting right on the, on the slab there and the building next to it has also been demolished and uh, amazon.com now has a big warehouse that sits through here this is the 80 foot tall building that was specially built to uh, test the uh, first stage of the apollo moon rocket so one of a kind And that's pretty much all I got. Uh, if you got any questions, we'll try and answer them. Awesome. Well, Get let's this thing shut down here, offline here. Let's see, how do I do that? Uh... Oh, I, you know what? I can I can do that for you here. Let me let me stop oh, sharing. I, I was mic. just going to hit the button until you took it. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Well, no, <laughs> let me put it on gallery view. Everyone, give Mike. A, Giant hand, giant hand. It was a great presentation. Mike, thank you, not just for that one, but for your many presentations. You've this, well, we, got, we got a lot more if you're interested. Yeah, well, I, I, I definitely appreciate you coming in and presenting for us. And that's amazing history too. It really is, it's amazing history, you know? Yeah, um, the, uh, Boeing wasn't the only one that was working with gyroscopes. All the satellites out there have these inertial propulsion systems on them. And uh, including the uh, space station has four big gyros on it for the same purpose. Yeah.